Hey class, welcome back. Welcome to the lecture for this week. This week we're going to be continuing talking about the history and development of the Jewish people. We've only got a couple more weeks of the history section, then we're going to be talking a little bit more topically about the Jewish people and Judaism in general. But again, just to reiterate, and I know I've said this, how many lectures have there been? Pretty much every lecture. Understanding the history is important and is essential to understanding um, the people. Um, how could you truly understand what it means to be Catholic without understanding a sense of the history of the Catholic faith and its uh, genesis and its uh, development through time? So that's exactly what we're doing. We're understanding the history of the Jewish people and thus understanding the concept and the principle of Judaism in and of itself. So this lecture is entitled Finding a Place, Zionism to the Rise of Israel. This is exciting stuff. It's controversial. It's um, confusing. There's a lot of different perspectives at play here. So I'm going to talk about some of the key points throughout this time period and some of the key figures, and then we will get into um, the rise of the state of Israel. We'll talk more about Israel next week, also in connection with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So let's talk for a second about proto-Zionism. First of all, I feel like I need to explain and define the concept of Zionism. I know we've talked about it a little bit in the past, but Zionism is essentially the Jewish form of nationalism. You see nationalism taking hold as a development and a, and a result of the, um, excuse me, of modernity, and you see a lot of nation states rising up as a new, uh, kind of a unique concept, um, and Israel is the result of the same the same concept, the same discussion and principles within Judaism itself. We talked about the Haskalah a couple of weeks ago, which is the rise of Jewish enlightenment um, and intellectualism that led to, um, in, in a lot of ways, this concept of Jewish nationalism. So proto-Zionism was even before people were talking about Zionism. This, is, uh, this uh, individual right here is Judah Alkali. Um, he was writing about Zionistic principles and concepts well before Zionism even arose. And we'll see in, a, in an upcoming slide that, Zi that practical Zionism that led, that was actual, more than just kind of pining, but actual Zionism that led to the establishment of the State of Israel began in the 1890s. And we'll see the context for that. But it's important to note that there were individuals talking about it even beforehand. Um, and many of you that are Jewish or are familiar with Jewish liturgy and things like that know that one of the, one of the main phrases that is said oftentimes in, in Jewish worship is, next year in Jerusalem. It's just this reference to Jerusalem, this reference to wanting to return. You know, the concept of, um, there's many concepts throughout the, the Kiddush and other, other parts of Jewish worship that, that refer back to the destruction of the temple, the loss of Jerusalem, the loss of the state of Israel. So there's always this underlying pining in, uh, in and among Jews. And that's why the concept of nationalism or, or Haskalah and a lot of Jews saying, we don't, we don't need that next year in Jerusalem anymore. We can be you know, Jewish and we can be French citizens. We can be Jewish and we can be German citizens. Well, we'll see a little bit more in this lecture, and we saw some in, la in the last lecture, that many Jews came to believe that that actually ideal was not possible, that they could never be on a, a secure and firm footing as other citizens being Jewish and living in their Jewish communities. So Judah Al Alkali was talking about this um, in 1860. He was very influenced by the Damascus Affair. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but it was basically where a number of elite Jews in Damascus were accused of killing a Christian monk and using his blood for, their, for ritualistic purposes. So a very, very horrible and sad um, example of anti-Semitism. And many Jews were attacked and, and many deaths and destruction of property and et cetera, in the, the, you know, the, the, the results of, of this uh, Damascus affair, this, this, po this pogrom. So let's read. This is a little bit of what Judah Alkali said. This just gives you a sense of the concept of religious proto-Zionism. Now we pray every day, let our eyes behold thy return to Zion in mercy. And if we believe our own words, then upon whom will the divine presence become manifest? Upon the trees and the rocks? Therefore, as the first step to the beginning of redemption of our souls, we must return to the land. 
um, and that's taken out of a broader quote. But you know, here you see a religious rabbi um, arguing for Jewish involvement in the retaking of the land of Zion. So this will stand in contrast to some of the videos that you'll watch for this week, um, and know that while many on one side of the religious debate believe that Jews cannot take their destiny into their own hands, that they are bound by covenant to follow God and to be, to be um, delivered when God delivers them, that's on one side, and then on others who claim, you'll see in some of the videos as well, and here in the writings of, of Rabbi Alkali, that, that God expects us to take these steps for ourselves. And as the first step, as Alkali is saying, we must return to the land of Israel. Now, the Dreyfus Affair, this is a really significant um, point that led to the establishment of practical Zionism. The Dreyfus Affair took place in 1894 and went till about 1906. Captain Alfred Dreyfus was a captain in the French military, the French army. Um, in 1894, he was arrested and was sentenced to life in prison for treason. Now, he was Jewish, and that's the, that's the important and salient point here. He was one of those Jews that believed to be, he could be Jewish and be integrated into the society at the same time and be a success in, in the uh, French military. So he was sentenced for treason, but it became very clear that he was a scapegoat. And in fact, there was a, a movement that moved to have the, the, the case re-looked re at, re-evaluated, and they actually identified who the culprit was. The accusation was that somebody sent dispatches from the Paris um, embassy to Germany with uh, sensitive and uh, confidential um, information. So once they identified kind of who it was, they still, the, the French government essentially suppressed that information so that Dreyfus would remain the scapegoat. And the, the opposition that became so heated that eventually Dreyfus was given another trial, and at that trial he was convicted again. And he was convicted to 10 years in prison this time, but at that point certain powers were aware of the volatile situation that this was creating in the country. And so he was pardoned at that point and was given back his commission at the rank of major, and he remained in the French military for the, the rest of his career. One of the reasons why this is so important is because there was a reporter, a journalist from Vienna named Theodor Herzl, who was also Jewish, um, though not religious or practicing necessarily. He was, he was um, also integrated into the society. But as he reported on this affair, on the Dreyfus affair, he became invariably convinced that Jews could never properly integrate into society, and they would be constantly facing situations like the Dreyfus affair. Theodore Herzl became the key figure in the development of modern Zionism, and his kind of branch of Zionism is, is referred to often as political Zionism. Um, you could almost call it practical Zionism as well, because you know this is more so than just writing tractates, and, and there were other Zionists that were writing around this time as well in different parts of, of Europe. Um, obviously, we know we have the proto-Zionists, etc., but Theodore Herzl was the first one that kind of said, Let's figure out how to actually do this. Let's not talk about it. Let's do it. He became uh, referred to as the father of Zionism. He established the first Zionist Congress in 1897. Now, he wasn't extremely religious, like I said, so he wasn't determined to have the return of the Jews or the Jewish state be in the land of Israel. In fact, he had other proposals. He proposed Uganda. He believed that there was a, you know, a, a place for the Jews there that they could establish a homeland there. That was quickly overruled at the Zionist Congress, and pretty much everybody knew that if the Jews were going to establish a state, it would be back where they originally had claim to the land, um, as they believed through God. So political Zionism is that Theodore Herzl tried to negotiate. He he was a you know he was a a, a very um, well spoken a businessman. He would. He actually met with the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire to try to get um, disposition for the Jews um, somewhere in the Ottoman Empire, and you know Palestine or Israel at that time was in the Ottoman Empire. 
So that's kind of what he did in terms of furthering the Zionist cause, this, this idea of returning to Israel or returning to forming a land where Jews could, could have their, their own rule and their own control over their own destinies. Another important branch of Zionism, labor Zionism, David Ben-Gurion, he's a very key figure. Um, he's a Russian Jew, again, not religious, not religious. Um, he immigrated in 1906 and um, became the key leader in what's called the Yeshuv, which was a word, a Hebrew word, to, de to describe the Jewish community. So it was basically the Jewish community in Palestine pre-Israel. Um, and David Ben-Gurion is very important because he was the leader of the Yeshuv from, I think it was about 1915 onward until the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. Um, and he actually became the very first Prime Minister of the State of Israel, the first, uh, the first national leader of the state. Another key labor Zionist figure is A.D. Gordon, Aleph, Aleph Dalit Gordon. Those are the two, uh, two Hebrew letters, Aleph and Dalit. Aleph Dalit Gordon was emphasized the concept of Jewish labor and Jews, up until this point, had not been able to own land. Um, not being citizens in all these lands in which they lived, they could not farm the land. They couldn't toil in the land. So Alf Dalit Gordon wrote extensively and talked extensively about the importance of Jewish labor in creating their state. That the state would not be built on the backs of anyone else, but it would come from the blood and the sweat of Jews themselves taking up professions that they were previously prohibited from doing. So is this, this very kind of romantic concept of a return to the land, of, of not just returning to the land of Israel, but returning to the land and the soil itself, getting your fingers dirty with the soil. This becomes very important in understanding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I will talk more about that next week. Revisionist Zionism. All of these different branches of Zionism had an important and a key role to play in the development of the State of Israel and the success of the State of Israel. Without revision of Zionism, Jews probably wouldn't have succeeded in establishing the state. Revision of Zionism is a radical form of Zionism that calls upon Jews to take up arms. It's a violent form of Zionism. It doesn't focus on, on uh, you know, soil under your fingertips. It's more about blood and it's more about gunpowder and fire. It's about establishing your right to the land by your strength of arms. So you can see that Zionism is about a lot of different coming together of philosophies. If you think about what makes up a people, different aspects, you know, their ability to provide for themselves, their ability to govern themselves, their ability to defend themselves, all of these things came together with different forms of Zionism and different leaders and writers that were, that were talking about the state of Israel in different contexts. Vladimir Jabotinsky was the key figure in the establishment of um, the revisionist Zionist movement. Um, he established a paramilitary organization called the Irgun that was important and vital. It was violent. It was um, a terrorist organization. It bombed British buildings. It bombed hotels. Um, it was doing anything it can to disrupt the British rule. And we'll talk about the British rule in just a minute, um, but the Ergun was Ergun was key in creating the Israeli Defense Forces in combining with what was called the Haganah, which was the defense force, the broader defense force of the Yeshuv itself. The Haganah, the Ergun, and a couple other groups, the Stern Gang, all sort of came together to form the Israeli Defense Forces um, during and after the establishment of the State of Israel. But again, the Irgun was very, very radical and very kind of uh, violent in its tactics, but it represented the concept of Jewish resistance. Now, this was happening around the time of the Holocaust, and so you can see that Israel was about creating kind of a new definition, a new form, a new identity of Jews with an emphasis on Jewish resistance and an ability to defend themselves. And those of you that know anything about the state of Israel, that has not changed since the very beginning of this movement. All right, cultural Zionism, we'll talk about that for a second. This is a really interesting story about Eliezer ben Yehuda, but I want to talk about Ahad Ha'am for a minute. Ahad Ha'am, who is pictured here, is a very key figure. He was very influenced by the, the Haskalah and the, the Jewish writers that reestablished Hebrew as a written language, 
There were periodicals, newspapers published in Hebrew. He was very influenced by that. He was a writer. He was an essayist. Um, he taught extensively that Jews can't just come to, to, to Israel without a national culture. They had to create a Jewish culture. So he talked a lot about, you know, uh, literature, novels, and things like that, encouraging people to establish a cultural aspect of Judaism. Because what if, what if um, Israel is based exclusively on, you know, the politics and the labor and the, the ability to defend itself, but it doesn't have a cohesive identity as a people. They don't have stories and tales and stuff that they can rally around. Obviously, they have their Jewish identity in the Bible, etc., but as if you haven't realized already, a lot of these individuals that establish the state of Israel are not ultra-Orthodox religious. A lot of them are integrated into these societies in which they live, but realizing that they can never truly be accepted in the societies. So they're looking to find a new culture that will bind them together as Israelis. One of the key components of that is the language. Eliezer ben Yehuda is a fascinating subject. He immigrated to Israel in 1881, and he took it upon himself to basically revive the Hebrew language. The Hebrew language was not a spoken language at the time, and it hadn't be, been for, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of, you know, over a thousand years. The Jews in the time of the Second Temple period, the time that uh, Jesus and the Second Temple and King Herod, the Jews spoke as their lingua franca, Aramaic. They spoke Hebrew as a liturgical language or a, a religious language in the synagogue, etc., but their day-to-day -day language, for the most part, was Aramaic. So even at that time, Hebrew was not kind of the most common, the common spoken tongue. And throughout all those years, Hebrew was still maintained as a biblical language spoken in the, in the synagogues in, in connection with the liturgy. But Elias or Ben Yehuda believed that a Jewish state could not be established based on the other languages that the Jews spoke, Yiddish, German, English, other languages, but that they needed a common language that would be basically new and unique to all of them. He believed that the Hebrew language, vivification of Hebrew, was essential to the establishment of the state of Israel. So what he did is he immigrated over there. He basically took the spoken language in the liturgical aspect, and he started creating all new words, new modern words that would, that would um, allow Hebrew to be a modern language. He raised his son speaking nothing but Hebrew, and he restricted access to any other language, and his son became the very first native Hebrew speaker. Just because his father chose to speak Hebrew in the home and chose to kind of revivify the Hebrew language. And that caught on. And then as, as people would come over to Israel from other nations, they would, you know, they would learn Hebrew language. Even now, um, somebody that's making aliyah, and we'll talk about that word in a moment, and coming up to Israel and, and claiming their citizenship as a Jew can have free instruction in the Hebrew language. Free... Um, Hebrew lessons to be able to integrate into the society. So Hebrew has proven to be essential, and now it is, you know, a, a, a valid and, and, you know, fully uh, flushed out with, gr with grammar and modern, modern vocabulary language that is used as the primary language of the state of Israel. Let's talk about Jewish immigration to the land of Israel. This concept of aliyah, those that are, of you that are Jewish have probably heard about this. It, the, it's a Hebrew word that literally means ascending or going up. And it's the idea of going up to Israel, coming back home, returning to the land where your forefathers dwelled. Um, and we start to see during this time of, of even proto-Zionism into practical Zionism, Jews beginning to come to the state of Israel and beginning to travel there to immigrate um, legally and illegally. It didn't matter. The first aliyah was 1880 to 1903. It was called the agricultural aliyah, and it was about 35,000 Jews. Now, many of those Jews, some estimates believe up to 90%, actually returned back to the countries where they came or went to other countries because life was not easy. They came from established you know, homes and, and whatnot in, in, uh, in Europe to land where they, they didn't know anything about agriculture. They had to try to figure it out. Um, they, they were living in land that... Um, you know, they had to build their own settlements, etc. So um, it was a very romantic concept, especially in the 1880s leading up through the 1890s, um, but not as practical, and so a lot of them returned. Um, the second aliyah, 1904 to 1914, starting to get a little bit more practical, a little bit more tied to the modern Zion, Zionistic movement and, and uh, 
the different forms of Zionism we talked about, 40,000 Jews, most of them came from Tsarist Russia as a response to anti-Semitism. So fleeing to Israel, and this, you know, this may validate right there the concept of a Jewish national homeland because so many Jews fled out of other nations where they were being persecuted and facing pogroms. Certainly that was the case in happening in Tsarist Russia. 40,000 Jews during that time fled to the land of Israel. Many of them ended up going elsewhere as well. The third Aliyah, 1919 to 1923. This is the, the, the follow after World War I um, and mostly Jews from Eastern Europe, about 40,000 Jews. So you can see the Yeshuv is starting to grow little by little. The fourth Aliyah, 24 to 29, mostly from Poland and mostly as a result of, of harsher U.S. immigration policy. Because, you know, when we talk about Jews in the Americas, we'll see that there was a big influx of Jews in 1880 coming to the United States. And most of the, that was a, a real extensive um, immigration to the United States. So a lot of these Jews were going to the United States as opposed to Israel and to other places. But as the U.S. really tightened its, its um, immigration policy post-World War I, a lot of these Jews ended up going to Israel and making Aliyah to Israel. 82,000 Jews during this five-year period probably the biggest boom that, that, that Israel has seen so far. Um, obviously, the biggest came in 1929 to 1939. This is as a result of Nazi accession to power and, and the beginnings of the Third Reich. Not, not the Holocaust just yet, but the beginnings and a lot of Jews realizing what, what is about to take place, fleeing from Europe, about 250,000 come to uh, Israel during that time. And now we have the Aliyah Beit, 1939, which is basically B, the, the kind of the next uh, broader, you know, group of aliyahs. 1939 to 48, this is in response to the Holocaust, um, 110,000 Jews come. Well, the white paper, I have that on here. The white paper, will un you'll understand that in more context when I talk about the British mandate. But the white paper was basically a British document that restricted, during this time period, restricted Jewish immigration to the land of Israel. So the Jews could not come, could not come, or the or the restrictions were extremely low, um, and you know the Yeshu fought this extensively and argued with Britain because they knew what was you know what was going on in, in Europe at the time and stuff like that. And there were several stories and accounts where Jewish immigrants that were trying to flee were not allowed in anywhere, United States, Israel, anywhere. So this led to rampant. Um, illegal immigration and a smuggling operation where Jews would be smuggled in and the Yeshu would, abs would absorb them because they were their brothers and they knew what they were facing, but they had to do this in secret and under the, the, uh, um, the authority of the British government in hiding. Um, so during that period, about 110,000 Jews. So you see, this is an interesting graph uh, uh, table here. You see the Jewish population. There's always been a little, a few, some Jews this kind of romantic notion of going up to, to Israel as a result of proto-Zionism. But then you see it get much more serious and the numbers start to increase extensively. So you see here, there's a, obviously a higher number here than here, so, so that's where a number of Jews would have left. But you see, beginning 1920, leading up to this establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, it increases exponentially, and you can see that increase here taking place, up to the point where there are about 650,000 Jews in the land of Israel in 1948. The British mandate. After the end of World War I, all of this area had been controlled by the Ottoman Empire. We talked about that a few weeks ago. The Ottoman Empire um, was around for, for you know, over a thousand years, um, and they, back, they backed the, uh, the German, um, the, the, basically the Axis powers in World War I, and they um, were dissolved after that, after World War I, the, the, um, and also with the rise of nationalism, the, the broad and, and vast Ottoman Empire was dissolved, and all these individual nation states were created. Um, now, the, the Allied powers, they took control of certain areas to create mandates until actual governments or whatever could be established. So... The mandate over Palestine was the British. You can see the Syria had the mandate over, uh, um, uh, French had the mandate over Syria and Lebanon. Um, Iraq was, uh, was British, and obviously British over, over Palestine. You can see this is a lot bigger area than Israel. Israel 
the state of Israel basically goes like this, you know, and this right here, the Jordan River, anytime you hear the West Bank, it means the West Bank of the Jordan River. So the west side of the Jordan River, that's the West Bank. It's not on this side of or anything like that. This is, this is Jordan, which was established as a nation around this time as well. So the British mandate was from 1920 to 1948. It was basically the British were in control. They were controlling immigration. They were controlling infrastructure and all these different things. Um, and it was very, you know, it, it, uh, they, they tried to kind of maintain the peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis. And uh, it, was, it was difficult because, like, like I mentioned before, there was elements of, um, of terrorism and things like that on the Jewish side. Um, and so the British were, were trying um, to maintain control over the land um, and trying to deal with the fact that, that the land was just basically being flooded by immigrant Jews that had nowhere else to go. Um, and so there was a lot of violence and a lot of um, opposition during this time of the mandate. Um, so just to show you, you know, Britain kind of created some of its own problems as well. Um, this is an example right here. Um, so leading up to the end of World War I, Britain, Britain basically uh, looked, looked forward to having sort of control in the area, and they were sort of claiming control in the area once the war was over. Um, but in order to get to that point, they made some promises and made some discussions uh, that contradicted each other. First of all, in 1915 to 1916, the Hussein, um, the, the Hussein McMahon correspondence was a correspondence between an army leader uh, speaking on behalf of Britain in Egypt with Hussein, who was the basically the, the emir, the leader of Mecca over the holy sites in um, in what became Saudi Arabia. So he was a, a prominent Muslim leader. And basically, Hus McMahon was asking for his help um, in fighting against the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire at that point was, was less religious and more um, tied to this, these concepts of nationalism as well. Um, and so he was trying to get Hussein to lead Arabs against um, the, uh, the, their their controlling or prevailing government of the Ottoman Empire. And basically what he promised is that England would support um, an Arab state in the land of Palestine, in that land where the mandate would, would be established, and that he would support, they would support the establishment of an Arab state. Now just that same year, during, while these correspondence were taking place, 1916, the Sykes-Picot Agreement was a clandestine discussion between France and England that they would divide up the land between themselves for their own nations, England and France. At that time, imperialism was still, was still a thing, and, and uh, you know, England and France still had colonies, etc. So uh, that was a contradictory, you know, just barely promised it to Hussein, and now they're talking about dividing it up with France. And then in 1917, there was a letter that was written to Lord Rothschild, who was an influential and extremely rich Jew, um, talking about Britain's plan to support a Palest or a Jewish state in Palestine. Here he says, and this is a very, very, very uh, famous and important excerpt: His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. So even though they have that caveat about protecting the non-Jewish communities, they're basically saying, we look with favor on establishing a national home for the Jewish people. So how are they going to have this be an Arab state divided up between England and France and a Jewish state? It just It's all contradictory, and it's part of kind of what led into this quagmire um, that became, you know, the, the, the British mandate. So, um, essentially, after the mandate ended, at post-World War II, the mandate ended in 1948, and that is really key as to why there was a war in 1948, the Israeli War of Independence happened in 1948, because the British pulled out in 1948, and it left an immediate power vacuum in that area. Now, the, the Transjordan, 
which later became name, named just Jordan, this area had already been created. So basically we're talking about this area controlled by the British mandate and all of a sudden the British pull out entirely. Now, the concept of a power vacuum is that suddenly there's a hole to be filled and whoever can fill that hole quickest can have uh, basically a, a, a sure and strong foundation set. Now, there's a lot of question about whether or not Palestine had a national identity, whether they saw themselves as Palestinians or just saw themselves broadly as Arabs living in that particular area, no different than any other Arabs. Remember, nationalism is a new concept. Nation states are new concepts, so at what point did Palestinians begin to see themselves as Palestinians? That is a hotly debated topic. But the reason I mention that is because Palestine didn't at the time have a very cohesive or a very strong leadership structure. And so as soon as the British pulled out, the Jews, who had a very significant and very built-up leadership structure through the Yishuv, uh, with David Ben-Gurion at the head, they rushed in and took control of the British Mandate infrastructure. The police stations, the government buildings, the fire stations, all these things, they came in and they set up in these areas that, you know, in, in these buildings and basically put themselves in these important locations to be able to continue to maintain the infrastructure so the, the issue would have that, that control. So basically that led to the outbreak of the war. 1948 was essentially a battle between the Yeshuv, between the Jews and the Palestinian Arabs, um, with some support from the outside. But, but basically it was a series of skirmishes um, in the, prop, the land of Israel proper between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Um, very violent, very um, chaotic. Um, but we won't talk a whole lot about the war itself, aside from the fact that after that first year, and Israel's basic, basically kind of success in that first year of battle against the Palestinian Arabs, then the war escalated, and the Yeshu found themselves fighting a series of Arab nations at that point. Lebanon and Syria in the north, um, Iraq, Transjordan in the east, Egypt in the west and the south, um, Egypt supported by Sudan. So all of a sudden, Israel is fighting not just the Palestinian Arabs, but also five um, at least five new Arab nation states who basically surround Israel on all sides, and there was fighting on all sides of the border. So, again, we're not going to talk a lot about this. There's been a lot of back and forth about, about this. There's, there's the romantic narrative of the beleaguered, beleaguered Jew that um, you know should never have won and is using homemade explosives and things like that and fights for their support. And then there's another kind of more modern and fleshed out narrative that you know, yeah, there were five nations, but these weren't nations that had significant military assets or forces to begin with. And the Jews had a lot of support from the worldwide Jewish community. So, you know, some people argue that, yeah, the Jews naturally should have won that war. It wasn't necessarily a miracle from on high. Um, and I'm not saying which one I ascribe to necessarily, but there's a little bit of back and forth, and it kind of depends on who is telling the narrative. But the bottom line is that Israel was successful and established itself as an independent nation. So in your readings for this week, one of the important documents that you'll be reading is the Declaration of Independence of Israel. Pay attention to the different aspects of Zionism that I talked about. Political Zionism, Labor Zionism, Revisionist Zionism, Cultural Zionism, and then read that document and see if you can't find examples of those Zionistic elements in the actual document itself, because that is one of the coolest things about that, the document of the establishment of the state of Israel. It represents a coming together of diverse opinions of Jews that are, that are underscored by the primary and principal desire to have a national state, though they differ in a lot of different areas and a lot of different ways of how to establish that, but the, this document sort of represents a coming together of all of these different and disparate um, principles to form a new national cohesive Israeli identity. Fascinating stuff. Next week we're going to talk about um, the the result kind of of the rise of the state of Israel and the opposition from the Arabs uh, states surrounding it and Palestine as well.